How many of you know somebody who does not believe in God? Anyone? How many of you have like friends that you see on a regular basis that are not Seventh-day Adventists? Okay. So how many of you know what most people believe? Like what do you think most people believe? Just raise your hand. Yeah, what do you think? Sure, evolution, natural selection. So they're atheists, right? So that is very popular belief. What else do people believe commonly? It's the higher power. Higher power. Well, I'm speaking of a specific belief system. I want the top five belief systems in the world, if you can tell me them. OK, top five belief systems, other than Ashley, who's heard the sermon. Yeah, well, Catholic would be the top five, but Catholic is considered under an umbrella. Christianity. Some people don't consider Catholics Christians. I personally do consider Catholics Christians. But you're right. If the Catholic Church was taken out of the category of Christian, we wouldn't even make the top five. Did you know that? Any others? Sure, Islam. That's right. Muslims. Buddhism. That's correct. Sure, Hinduism. So those are the top five belief systems. Just so you know, Adventism is not there. It's a very small little religion. But here's the thing is if you were to ask somebody, well, how do you believe everything came into being? Natural selection, Big Bang, Krishna, Allah, or whoever started something out. Nobody really was there, right? They don't really know how it all began. So you can't really say from direct testimony. So how do you decide what's true? Like, how did you decide to become whatever you are today? I assume most of you are Seventh-day Adventists, but not necessarily all of you, I'm sure. So how did you become in the belief of how you believe it right now? Based on evidence. Oh, wow, evidence. I'm surprised. I would assume most people, how many people here grew up in the current belief system that they're in right now? So the vast majority, right? But you said evidence, so you didn't grow up as an Adventist. Okay, very interesting. Because from the Adventist actual literature itself, that's how we are supposed to decide. God does not compel men to give up their unbelief. Before them are light and darkness, truth and error. It is for them to decide which they will accept. The human mind is endowed with power to discriminate between right and wrong. God designs that men shall not decide from impulse. What's impulse mean? Emotion or what you feel is right. Well, I feel this is right. How many people have heard people say that? Most of us actually make our decisions based on that. Well, I don't feel that that's right. But based on what? Why, why don't you feel that that's right? But from what? What does God want us to decide from? Weight of evidence. So that's exactly correct. So this statement here, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you think that's a big statement? Yeah. I think it's a huge statement. To say that God created the heavens and the earth and that all good things come from him, that's a huge statement. And I think that not only is that a huge statement, but to say that the earth was void without form and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering on the face of the waters, then God said, what? Let there be light. And God saw that the light was what? So not only did God create everything, but what things does he create? Good things. So that's also a pretty big statement. Not only is God or some higher power, like some people are trying to say, he's not just the, the blind watchmaker. I don't know if you've heard that argument. But he's not just someone who started things and then just kind of let them go. Like, that's what many deists believe. They believe that God created things, but he kind of let you do your own thing. But that God is not only a creator, but he's a personal God, and he creates things for what purpose? For, for good purposes, right? But here's another statement that the Bible makes. God himself that formed the earth and made it, he has, made, he has established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it for what reason? 
to be inhabited. So what did he create the earth for? For us, right? So again, that's a big statement. So God is creator. He's a personal creator. He's a good creator. And he creates things for you, for you. Is that a big statement? It's a huge statement. That's no joke statement. Let's see if there's evidence for that. So when you look at the sun, did you know if we were just a little closer, a little further away, there'd be no life on earth? I mean, it's impossible. We'd be frozen. You think it's cold in the northeast right now? Did you know with the wind chill, it's like negative 108 right now in the northeast? I know. Isn't that crazy? That's cold. That's like Eskimo cold. But we'd be a lot colder than that if we were just a little further from the sun. Not much. Just like less than 1% difference. Do you know we'd all be underwater if the moon was a little bit different in its orbit? So is there evidence in the fish, the birds, and the animals for one of the five belief systems? So here's the question. Why does that lion have fangs and claws according to evolution? Yeah, because he's a carnivore, right? So here's the thing. Claws and fangs. He eats meat. He's designed to eat meat. Everything about him is designed to eat meat. Okay. However, do you know what cats eat when they're sick? Yeah. Well, isn't that interesting? So why is that? Isn't that a little odd? Don't you think that's a little odd? So they're not 100% designed that way, maybe, right? Did you know that one day they'll eat grass again? Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? So let's look at zebras. When you look at camouflage, this doesn't seem to go with camouflage, does it? You can't really hide with your tuxedo in the savanna. So not everything seems to go along with an evolutionary model. Because evolutionary model says that things are designed with specific characteristics so that they can do what? Survive. Yeah, survive and then do what? Yeah, pass on the genome, right? That's the whole purpose. But let's think about this for a minute. How many people love dogs? How many people love cats? How many people love neither? Oh, come on, don't raise your hand. Come on. Why you gotta be like that, right? Unless you're allergic, that's the only pass I'll give you. But here's the thing, did you know Anyone, do you know anyone who has high blood pressure? Raise your hand. Do you know anyone who has high blood pressure? Okay. Did you know if you give one of these little furry friends to them, if they're a senior citizen, that it will lower their blood pressure as much as a drug? Did you also know anyone who grew up with a dog? Do you know anyone who grew up with a dog, like from square one, like they were born and the dog was already there? Raise your hand. Did you know that if you do that, your gut flora and biome is completely different than mine? It's true. And that you have less autoimmune diseases, you have less allergies, you have less type 1 diabetes. Were you aware of that? Does that seem to go with, well, the dog has all those things for its own survival? Or does it seem like it has some characteristics for your survival? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Doesn't all seem to go that way. But let's take a look at not just the good, but even the very good. When God created man and woman, right? Very good. That's what I say when I see Ashley. Mmm, very good, right? <laughs> it's true. I'm just saying. I'm just being honest. So God saw everything he had made. And indeed, it was what? Very good. Now, is that what we see in God's plan for mankind? Let's find out. So what is God's original very good plan for our diet? This is Ashley's favorite part. Yes. What, what's, our, what's his design? There's a little hint. If you have the ability to see that little font, you'll get the little hint. Fruits. Seeds, nuts, grains, those are seeds, 
We already said fruit. Yes. Genesis 3.18, what happened after sin? What was added? No, not meat. It's vegetables. People always say meat, right? That happened after a flood. And why was there meat after the flood? There was nothing else to eat, right? I mean, anyone dive? Anyone been a diver? What if you go down too deep? What happens? Well, that's if you ascend too quickly. That's an air embolism. It's not if you go down too deep. If you go down too deep, you get squashed, right? Because it's too much pressure. Your ears eventually cannot withstand that kind of pressure. So that's the thing. I mean, you can auto-regulate a little bit, but eventually you just can't go down too deep without a dive chamber. And so if you put the entire earth under like seven miles of water, right, it all gets squashed. So if there's nothing else to eat, you got to eat the plants, right? And you have to eat the, the animals that eat the plants. Does that make sense? But here's the question. Do we see evidence for this? In fact, I'll show you the evidence right now. What do you think of when I go like that? Wow, such a variety of colors. colors, right? But you know what's interesting? When you look at different species, do you know what species can see the most visual colors in their brain? Anyone know? It's you. Did you know that? Isn't that funny? We can't see infrared or ultraviolet, but we can see more visual colors than any other species. Dogs are very close, but not quite, because they got to be able to help us, right? Pick out our sweater or whatever if we're blind, et cetera. But what's also interesting is there's a variety of what else? Textures, Textures right? Shake your neighbor's hand. I always like to shake Ashley's hand because I can warm it up too at the same time, right? Did you know you just touched the most complex program in that person's entire being? I'm serious. That particular area of your body takes up more of the hard drive space than anything else. Did you know that? This right here differentiates you from other primates. Did you know that? Right here. Just this thing. Just this, this, like this thing right here. Right? I have an opposable thumb. That's why when you get a penetrating injury here, you always have to check for this when you're a doc. Because if you miss the injury, it's called the million dollar nerve. You know why it's called the million dollar nerve? Yeah, that's what you'd pay out if you miss it, if you're a doctor. Because that person can't grasp anymore, right? They have what's called ape hand. This is ape hand. Apes do this. Does that make sense? They can't do this. So this is the most complex thing in your entire brain, is your hand. And this can discriminate between textures of less than a millimeter different. Did you know that? Whereas your back cannot. Your hands were designed for picking, for discriminating between different textures. OK. What a variety of colors, textures, and? Uh, flavors, sure. Smells, flavors, tastes, sure, absolutely. But here's the thing. What about meat? How many different colors is meat? No, I'm just being honest. How many different colors is meat? Well, raw or cooked, right? Pretty much. How many different colors is meat? How many different textures is meat? It depends on how much you cook it, right? Or don't cook it. And how many different flavors is meat? Well, it tastes like chicken. I, right? It all tastes like chicken. It depends on how you flavor it, though. Isn't that the case? It depends on how you flavor it. I can have Jimmy Dean soy sausage by just using Jimmy Dean seasoning. Did you know that? I can make soy. Impo That's why Impossible Burger tastes almost like the real thing, because it's the seasoning and texture. All you need to do is get the right seasoning and texture, and you pretty much got it. So meat pretty much has just really two textures. So you are designed for vast varieties of colors, vast varieties of tastes, vast varieties of textures. And you know how I know that? This. Is the homunculus a made up word? Did I just make that up? <laughs> no? No? Whoever is clicking their pen, utilize your hand less for a moment. Thank you. 
But anyway, this is the largest, the thing in sensory and motor, the largest area of your brain. What are the two second largest? What do you think? This is basically a schematic of how much each body part takes up in your head. What do you think? Number one's hands down, right? Hands down the hand, ha, ha, ha. Tongue, and then what's probably number three? Probably the eyes or the nose, right? So your number three, top three things are texture, colors, and taste. And what do you know? The diet in Genesis 129 just happens to be adapted to that. Is that a coinky dink? I think not. It's very interesting though, but your brain is designed for this. But let me ask you another question. Where does digestion begin? Everyone says the mouth. I'm going to prove to you it doesn't. Watch this. How many people like having lemon water in the morning? Very good detox, by the way. You know what else is a good detox? So what just happened to all of you? No, wait a minute, but you didn't eat the lemon. Why would you salivate? You saw me do it. So where does digestion begin? Oh, not the eyes. So imagine if you will, you are back at your mother's home. Think about that. Mama Louie, right? You were with your mom. And she is cooking your favorite dish of all time, the comfort food. I don't know what that is, cucumbers or some sort of eggplant relish or something. Right, right? I don't know who knows what it is, right? Whatever it is. And it's not yet ready. But you sneak over and you take a little taste while nobody's looking. And then you wake up. It was all a dream. So where does digestion begin? In the mind, right? In the brain. And your mind is perfectly adapted to the exact diet of the Bible. Did you know that? But let's go to the mouth. When you produce that saliva, everyone here got a little exercise for their salivary glands, right? Do you know what your body said at that moment? It said, give me plant. And do you know how it said that? It said it in the terms of salivary amylase. Every drop of saliva contains an enzyme specific for plant carbohydrates. Did you know that? So whether you are carnivore, herbivore, or whatever vore you want to be, pescatarian, egatarian, lacto ovo, ovo, vegan, whatever you want to be, right? It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Your body still says, give me plant. How many of you have ever seen a professional racehorse before? Of course, not at the races, right? Of course, you don't go there. But anyway, those horses are worth millions of dollars. Did you know they have their own massage therapists? They are literally taken care of. Wouldn't you like to have your own massage therapist? I would, right? Can you imagine of the owner of Seabiscuit or Secretariat coming over and say, yeah, you know, uh, my horse, he's lacto-ovo. Oh, my horse is pescatarian. Would they, would they ever say that? Do you know what those horses eat? They eat non-GMO, organic, like legit grains is what they eat. And do you know what the other horses eat that are professional racehorses? No, they eat the same. They eat the same. They all eat the highest grade vegan grains on planet Earth. Did you know that we're the only species that doesn't obey that? All other animal species, they know what they're supposed to eat. Except, oh, no, I want to eat by my blood type, I know this, and it. we're nuts. We're insane, right? We don't even know what we're supposed to eat. We spend billions of dollars in the weight loss industry to figure out what we're supposed to eat. Did you know that? Oh, I got to do paleo, the South Beach diet, you know, Atkins, what? Literally, it's a multi-billion dollar industry because we don't know this. Isn't that funny? It's very odd, isn't it? 
What about the stomach? What happens in the stomach? Digestion, right? And if you eat protein, your stomach has to produce more hydrochloric acid. Now imagine for a moment if you compared this guy to this guy. Who produces more hydrochloric acid? The lion. How much more? Ten times more. Did you know that? Isn't that crazy? But think about this. What's this for, this little green thing? What's it for, though? I know it's a gallbladder, but what's it for? Emulsification of fat, right? Emulsification of fat. Now, did you know how to make rock candy? Who knows how to make rock candy? Of course, none of you make candy. None of you even eat candy. I know that. It's OK. No judgment. I'm not here to judge. I'm just here to give you information and connect you to the real transformation, right? So rock candy is you take sugar and you boil it, right, with water. And then when you cool it and you put a little string in it, what happens? It crystallizes. So ultimately, if you have a high concentration of sugar and then you take away the water, what do you get? Crystals. Did you know that works inside you too? You have a high concentration of animal fat. You don't drink enough water. And what do you get? Rock candy. <laughs> oh, gallstones, right? Do you think that's the design of the gallbladder? Does it get gallstones and pancreatitis? Well, obviously not, right? But did you know that 100 million people in our country have gallstones? One third. Not all of them are symptomatic because the gallstone actually has to lodge in the neck and get stuck, and the body has to not be able to push it through to create symptoms. What about this long thing here? What's this for? Absorption, right? And did you know that in the small intestine, you have things called villi? They're little finger-like projections that increase surface area. So you can absorb more. Did you know that? And on the very tip of those villi is something called, it's something to digest milk. I'll give you a hint. Lactase, right? Other than Ashley, I know you know all of this. I actually invited Ashley to come hear this portion of the sermon at a church as an excuse to kind of get her there. But I mean, it was legit, right? She's a dietitian. I could like, like you get that through as the invitation. And it worked. She came. So praise the Lord. But anyway, have, you have lactase on the tip of those chorionic villi. And that's for digesting milk. And did you know? that the enzymatic activity of the lactase goes down at a certain age in all races and in all peoples. Do you know what age that is? Yeah, it's two or three. Who said two or three? That's right. How do you know that, Ludo? That's how long the mother that was breastfeeding her son. Really? Who was, who was, who was breastfeeding her son? Oh, really? Oh, two or three. I didn't know that. I thought he was 12. Sorry, that's a long time. But anyway, I know I'm serious. I thought he was given up at, oh, it was Samuel. It was Samuel, I think, that was given up at two or three or something like that. But anyway, the bottom line is, is you're correct. All cultures, it drops. But did you know what cultures where it only drops like this? It goes, you know, just like 5% drop. Any country you can guess? Well, I'll start with the other ones. Which countries or cultures do you think it goes? African Americans, definitely. Asians, definitely. And Hispanics. Did you know that? So the people that it drops least for is Caucasians. But which Caucasians? Scandinavians. Who said that? That's correct. Why? Because they live in an area where you can't grow plants. They drink, therefore, a lot of milk, right? That's the whole point. Right? So they need the lactase because they're not eating plants. Like winter, what are you going to eat? Not much, right? Like root vegetables and probably dairy because your cows can still produce milk in the winter. Did you know that? As long as they have calves, they can crank it out. They somehow find that little last weed that's growing there and, and convert that to good milk protein, right? But what's very interesting is when you look at this phenomenon, I went to med school at Loma Linda as many of you 
did dentistry and whatnot. And we had a combined class for the docs and the dentists. So I was actually in class with you, at least your colleagues I was, right? And we had this specialist in lactation, and her motto was breast is best. And she was a researcher, and she put up study after study. She said, look at this, higher IQ, breast over bottle, of course, right? Look at this, better oxytocin, better bonding. Look at this, fewer autoimmune diseases. Look at this, colostrum, it's the wonder drug. Look at this, and she kept putting up slide after slide of the benefits of breast milk until finally, one of the dental students, he couldn't take it anymore. He stood up and he said, you've convinced me, I'm switching over. <laughs> True statement, this actually was in class. Now, now why do we all laugh? Well, but why do we all laugh at that? Because what's funnier? to go back to drinking your own species milk or drink another species milk. Seriously, did you see this actual, this was a social experiment actually done on, in the United States. And they said, these are a bunch of milks. We want you to pick out which one you pick best. And you know which one they picked out? They're like, wow, these are the best. And all the people there, they're like, this is fantastic. We need to know what it is. Is it macadamia? Is it hemp? They're like, it's dog milk. <laughs> now, why, do, why are you upset that it's dog milk that tastes the best? Because it's just in your head, right? You're like, I couldn't drink some other species milk, but did you know you do it all the time? Isn't that odd? Have you come into the secret place of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the ice drops? Is there a secret of the snow? Have you thought about that? The Bible says there is. And if you look closely, you can unlock it. Every single snowflake is perfect. And it defies the second law of thermodynamics. Did you know that? If you remove energy from a system, the second law of thermodynamics says it becomes chaotic, right? Less ordered, right? Less ordered. So in other words, it would turn into rain or water, right? Because the water molecules are less ordered. But when you remove energy from raindrops, as they fall even, they are able to create not only something more ordered, but something perfect, and not only something perfect, but did you know that every single snowflake is a message to you and I? Do you know why that is? What number is the snowflake based after? And seven? Show me where you see seven. Uh, well, okay. Uh, no, but thank you for that guess. But it's based on a hexagonal, right, design, which is six, right? When were you created? Right. So every snowflake is perfect. Every snowflake is unique. And every one of you in Christ can be perfect. But you are unique. You're not going to be the same. And don't expect people to be the same because you don't expect snowflakes to be the same. That's the amazing thing about snowflakes is that they're all different, but they're all perfect, right? Let's look at this. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and plants for the service of man, that he may bring forth food out of the earth and wine that maketh glad the heart of man and oil to make his face shine and bread that strengthens man's heart. So plants are for the service of who? Do you believe that plants are actually for you? Is there evidence for that? That's the question. Let's take a look. How many people like flowers? You do like flowers? But why do you like flowers? There's three main characteristics of flowers that draw human beings to them. What are they? Color. Yes, lots of colors. Smell is another one. Shape. Sure, absolutely. So geometric symmetry is one of them. Have you heard of the Fibonacci series? It's a series of numbers and shapes in nature that you really like. And did you know that all of nature is ruled by math? All of nature is ruled by law? Did you know every one of them follows equations? Did you know that every fern branching, every lightning bolt, every nautilus shell is all ruled by law and math? Every last one of them. It's an un unbelievable thing. But the Fibonacci series is like a sunflower, right? It's a series of numbers and patterns that your brain like really likes. So those are the three things. However, remember evolution is 
survival, passing on the genome, right? So how do flowers survive? Yeah, bees, right? They pollinate them and that's how flowers reproduce. But here's the question. How do bees find the flowers? By what? Actually, they don't see those colors. The what fragrance? Uh, too much pollution now. What else? Not colors. They don't, they don't see the colors like you and I do. I'll give you a hint. I put it up on the slide. That piece of paper is an invention from Poland. And it's a green invention. So this is a piece of paper. And the paper is laced with glucose. And do you know what these circles are that are painted on it? They're invisible. You can't see them. But if you were able to see into the spectrum of the ultraviolet, you could. Bees find flowers by reflected ultraviolet light and a food source. So when you're done with this paper, who finds it? The bees. And they eat it. And so, no trash. You're all good, right? But here's the thing. Did you know that a bee will come to a square dish of sugar water? It can be any shape. It can be clear. It can be no color. The bees don't need to have this at all. So my question is, why do the flowers have those characteristics? Ah, oh, come on. Are you sure it's for you? You don't sound that convinced. How many people have kids? How many of you can tell me what pattern that all human babies are drawn to more than anything else? Yes, it's two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Did you know that? That a face will draw a baby like nothing else. It's like, room, room. The other thing that will draw children is screens, room, right? Keep the screens away from them till their brain's done developing. I didn't have my first smartphone until I was graduated from Stanford and in my job as an attending physician. I wasn't the guy lining up for the iPhone. I was a little skeptical on those things. And now you see the literature that's come out about it. It's devastating. Not just for children, but for adults. Nobody can sleep now. You know why? The screens. Yes. But here's the question. If God really wanted to say that every flower is for human beings, you know what he could do with a flower? He could just put a smiley face on it, right? And he did. <laughs> Photoshop? It's true. This is a monkey orchid. It's found in South America, and it grows at elevations of 1,000 to 2,000 meters. Not lowlands, but could you get to 1,000 meters? Probably you could, yeah. And the other thing is, what do your kids all start drawing? when they're young? Stick figures, right? That's in their head from day one. Did you know that? And it's also in nature. And if you doubt and think that maybe it's an optical illusion, there's other kinds too. And if you still further doubt, there's women too. They wear dresses. I'm just saying. If you have a problem with that, take it up with the author. What does that look like? A baby, and it's called a baby in a crib orchid. Did you know that? What does that look like? Yeah, how does that help the plant? It does not. That's the whole point. You see anything? A spider. I've never had anyone say spider. I see a tiger. What do you see? I see a quail, actually. What do you see? A duck. It's not just a duck. It's a mallard duck. What do you see anything there? Look closer. What do you see? Yeah. Did you know that's just an orchid from Trader Joe's? <laughs> and if you think that's an optical illusion, nope, there's other flowers like that too. What does it look like this plant is doing? Praying. And what's the most important thing to pray for? What's the most important gift? It brings all other gifts in its train. Holy Spirit. Bud stage, blossom stage, no joke, and it blossoms on the day of Pentecost. No, just kidding. I had somebody say that to me. I haven't really verified that. I think they're wrong, honestly. But that's okay. Listen, you don't need to embellish what God has created. The evidence is enough. Just right there. Because my question is, why does it do that? How does that help the plant? It, it does not. 
right? That, that's the whole point. I had a group of atheists. I presented this presentation, not the whole presentation, but just the flower aspect. I presented it, and the entire audience was atheists. Did you know that? And so I asked them afterwards. I said, so what do you think of the flowers? What do you think of, et cetera? And people didn't really want to talk to me. And finally, one lady talked to me. And I said, hey, what do you do? She says, I'm an artist. And I said, so what do you think about the flowers? She's like, well, that doesn't prove God. I said, well, why, why do you think that? And she said, because you know, it's just our Western culture that causes us to look at that flower and see a face. And I'm like, are you smoking crack? <laughs> I didn't say that. But in my head, I thought it. But instead, I said this. I said, oh, can you explain that? And she said, sure. Someone from South America or China or something, they might not see a face there. And then I thought, you really are smoking crack. But I didn't say that either. I said, well, what might they see then? I don't know. I'm not Chinese. And she walked away. <laughs> and I felt like saying, last time I checked, every person from China still had two eyes, a nose, and a mouth, which is what makes a face. But that just shows you that information doesn't change people. You can tell them what to do or what not to do. That doesn't change them, right? But at least she has the evidence in front of her. She at least can think about it for a moment. But let's take a look at this. But now ask the beasts. Who are the beasts? The animals. And they shall teach thee. And the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth. Anyone have plants, live plants? Do you talk to them? Don't lie. Don't lie. Do you talk to your plants? Do they talk back? Yeah, that's, that's the funny thing. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. And what will the plants, the animals, and the fish all tell you? That God is creator, right? That's what they're all supposed to tell you. But let's take a look. Do they really tell you that? Any people like art? Who likes art? Okay, great. When you bring your kids to the beach, what do they all make? You know, it's so funny. Do anyone know who Miley Cyrus is? Miley Cyrus? Good. I'm so glad you don't know who Miley Cyrus is. <laughs> Probably because most of you are over 65. No offense, but that's just, that's all right. She was before your time. But anyway, she started off in Disney, and now she's just nuts, basically. She's crazy really crazy. And she has a song called Flowers. And she says, I can buy myself flowers. Write my name in the sand. I can talk to myself for hours. And I'm just like, how sad is that? I mean, really? Take yourself out to dinner? If you want to torture me, have me eat dinner alone. I mean, literally, I will confess to whatever you want me to confess to. <laughs> Eating dinner by myself is torture. Why would you take yourself out to dinner? Why would you buy yourself flowers? Why would you write your own name in the sand? What's amazing is when someone else writes your name in the sand, right? Because you know that they care about you, right? That's the whole point. And so your kids, when they go to the beach, they build sand castles, right? However, did you know that the person who made this sand castle was not discovered till the late 70s, early 80s. What they don't tell you is that there's lots of other more intelligent animals in the ocean. Did you know that? Like way more intelligent than the puffer. Dolphins, super intelligent. Whales, like mega intelligent. Did you know an octopus has the problem solving ability of a five-year-old child? If you take a crab, throw it in my jar, in the front seat there, I have a little mason jar, the octopus will eventually figure out how to like unscrew the jar and get at the crab. It's that smart. The puffer has a brain the size of a walnut. But why does he make the most complex structure in the entire world? What's the purpose? Do you know what evolution says? Is it says that once he attracts a mate, they mate and they lay eggs. Guess where? in the structure. Now, they say that the structure is to protect the eggs from washing away. But what they don't tell you is that only one pufferfish makes the structure. Like one species of pufferfish makes the structure. 
even though pufferfish are in all oceans of the entire world. Did you know that? So don't all pufferfish need to attract a female, yes or no? Well, yeah, obviously they do. Don't all pufferfish need to protect their eggs? Well, obviously yes, right? So they say it's to protect the eggs. But here's the other thing they don't tell you. Do you know where they lay the eggs in the structure? In the center. Did you know that's not the most ergodynamically best place to hide the eggs? Do you know where the best place would be? On the outside deep ridges, like you can take a look at them. If you look at the outside deep ridges, you'd want to put it right in one of those because that's really, really deep. It wouldn't go anywhere at that point. You could put a little depot of eggs down there, current wouldn't move it. But if you put it in the middle, that's the dumbest place to put it, right? Because it's like, eh, 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 free lunch, right? Free lunch, free lunch. But what's interesting is just like the song Flowers, right? You can buy yourself flowers. But how meaningful is that? Like how many of you ladies go out and just buy yourself flowers? How good does that feel when you do that? Oh, I love them, great. But how does it feel compared to when your husband buys them and if there's no occasion? Ooh, that's something, right? No birthday, no anniversary, and you say, honey, why'd you buy them? Just because I love you. Yeah, right? <laughs> At that point. And that's the significance, right? Yes, you can write your own name in the sand. But it's different when someone else writes your name in the sand. Because here's the thing. Did you know the only country that has this structure? Well, let me ask you this question. What country, by their own surveys, is the most atheist by percentage? Not number, but by percentage. You know what country is the most atheist in the world? It's Japan. And do you know the only place where you can find this structure? Japan. Because if God was like you and I, we would make the structure in Israel. Did you know that? Because we're selfish human beings. We favor those who favor us. We're nice to those who are nice to us. But God is different than you and I. And praise God, I'm not on the throne. Praise God, he's on the throne. Because if I was on the throne... None of us would be saved. Probably I wouldn't be saved. <laughs> but God sends his most powerful evidence to the ones who need it most. That's who is God. Who likes coconuts? Are coconuts bad for you? Yes, no? Well, let's find out. Where do coconuts grow? Tropical. Do they require cultivation? Do they require weeding? No, they require nothing, right? They just grow on their own. Tropical environments. And what environment would you most likely get dehydrated? No, because you can sweat and cool yourself off. Did you know that? In the tropical countries, you can sweat, take a shower, then you need another shower. You can't cool yourself off. Did you know that? Heat stroke is most common in tropical countries because you can't thermoregulate. Does that make sense? But did you know if you're really dehydrated and sweating a lot, do you know what you should drink? Wow, really? Are you sure? <laughs> How many people know that the University of Florida football team was investigated for using controlled substances many decades ago? And there's a reason why, is that they were consuming a substance before their games and during their games, and they were winning them all. Do you know what they were drinking? It was not coconut water. Come on, right? I'm not going to make it that easy. What were they drinking? Right, and why is it called Gatorade? Yeah, that's right. Their mascot is the Florida Gator, therefore it's Gatorade, right? Pretty simple. But what is Gatorade? Sugar and water and... Electrolytes. What's coconut water? Sugar, water, and electrolytes. What do you know? Could it be coincidence? I think not. But wait, there's more. What happens if someone's vomiting? What do you do for them then? No, like if they're vomiting, they can't drink the coconut water. What are you going to do for them? IV, right? You're just going to put anything in their IV? 
Did you know if you mess up putting someone's IV together, you can kill them? It's very serious. It has to be sterile. It has to be the exact concentration. It has to be exact pH. It has to be exact osmolarity, osmolality. Everything has to be perfect. You don't can't just throw IV fluid together. Did you know that? But did you know that when I was in Fiji, I ran out of IV fluid. And the boy's dean who was in charge of construction, he was listening to the, my health message because they had me give a health message like for a few minutes before the day started. And I said, make sure that you pee in the morning until your pee is clear. In other words, hydrate in the morning because you won't get time later in the afternoon. And he laughed and out loud he said, huh, I haven't even peed yet this morning. I said, I'll probably see you in clinic this afternoon. And sure enough, I did. And why? Because he was vomiting. And how are you going to rehydrate yourself if you're vomiting? Because you vomit, you get more dehydrated, you get more acidotic, you feel more nauseous, you vomit more, right? So it's this, a vicious cycle, right? So I ran out of IV fluid. What do you think I gave him? IV coconut water. I said, three coconuts IV stat. And they prepared the coconuts for me. And did you know I rehydrated him with three coconuts and he was fine? He was able to drink the coconut water after that. He stopped vomiting, even without meds. But that's just coincidence, right? And wait, there's more. Did you know that the inside of that coconut is sterile? So why do you think the coconut's there? For you, right? You can buy yourself the flowers. You can buy yourself the drink. But it's much more significant when someone else makes it for you. And that is the message we read from the animals, the plants, the birds, right? Who discovered DNA? Two scientists. They actually stole it from a female scientist, but you know, that's how we, we guys do. You come up with all the ideas and that you try to make it seem like it's our idea and so it will feel good, right? That's kind of how, no, I'm serious. That's kind of how a lot of things work. So, but who are the scientists credited for discovering the double helical structure of DNA? Crick and Watson, right? What did they believe? Evolution. Did what they believed change their philosophy? It should have. It did, actually. Do you know what they believed after their discovery? What do you think? No. Oh, well, somewhat. Somewhat. They believe that aliens came to Earth and started life. Uh, you laugh. You can read it in his book. It's called The Book of Life. His memoir, his autobiography, Francis Crick, says that aliens came and started life on Earth. But my question for Dr. Crick and Dr. Watson, one of them is dead now, obviously, so I'm not going to ask them because the dead know not anything, right? Is, good doctor, who created the alien? Because ultimately, my friends, whether you are Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, Islamic, or atheist, even the proof, even with the weight of evidence in, from you, in front of you, what did Watson and Crick believe? Did they acknowledge Jehovah as creator? They refused to acknowledge the evidence in front of them. Crick actually says, I could no longer believe in the Big Bang. Why, Dr. Crick? Because I saw design. I saw language. I saw order. Because the same sequence of amino acids that codes for your eye color codes for the same eye color in that giraffe, in that plant. He says, I saw a common language in all life. He submitted to the evidence, but because of his hard human heart, he would not acknowledge the glory of Jehovah. And that is true for you and I. We can have the answers, but it doesn't change our heart. Do you realize that? You can be lost in the church. You can be lost as an Adventist. You can be selfish as an Adventist. Do you realize that? I call you out right now. 
95% of your time, your money, and your efforts are spent on you and your family. True or false? True. I don't care if you're religious or not. It doesn't matter. Whatever the five religious groups you belong to, this is the issue. But did you know all of nature teaches us something different? All of nature ministers to some other life. Did you know that? Sin has marred God's perfect work, yet that handwriting remains. Even though I'm sinful, even though my nature has fallen, God's writing still remains on me and all around me and is calling me to be different, to change. Even now, all created things declare the glory of his excellence. There is nothing except for what thing? The selfish heart of man that lives unto itself. And I don't know about you, but I want to change. I want to be different. When I see my life, I see that I am out of harmony with other things in nature. I see that my selfish heart is not what the message is in nature. In nature, all life depends on other life. Did you know that? They are interrelated. We in America, we want to be our own separate thing, right? My family, my culture, my house, right? That's the way we are. But God doesn't want us to be that way. And he gives you the evidence. He shows it to you in nature. But my question to you is, will you be like Watson and Crick? Or will you yield and come back into harmony with the great symphony of creation? You and I are the only sour note in that symphony. Did you know that? We are the only sour note. Other species don't wipe out other species. Did you know that? Other species are not like crazy. I mean, even predators, they only prey on the sick ones. Did you know that? The slow ones, the small ones. They don't go after the strong, healthy ones, mainly because the strong, healthy ones will like annihilate them, right? But again, that's my point. Everything is interdependent. But my question is, what about you? What about me? I want to ask God to change me from selfishness to unselfishness, to think a little less of others um, as far as taking from me, but think more of how I can give to them, right? And if that's your decision, stand with me as we pray and close. Father in heaven, we want to pause for a moment and confess our selfishness, Lord. We do live unto ourselves. It's true. 95% of our time, our money, our talents, our resources are spent on us or our families. Instead of like you, Lord, that you send your greatest evidence and power to the Japanese. You knew that one day they would forget you. You knew long ago. And so you sent the Japanese fish to them. Just like the city of Nineveh, you knew that they would depart from you. And so you sent them a fish. And Father, I just pray that you would send us to others. Help us to not spend our talents and time and example and resources just on ourselves and our family, but to ask ourselves, who needs me the most? Who can I be a blessing to the most, Lord? And do that and once more come at last into harmony with the great design that you designed us for. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.